Chapter 7, Foreign Affairs For most people, American foreign policy began on September 11, 2001. In some ways, I fit into this category, and in other ways, I did not. I'll explain. When I was young, maybe 9 or 10 years old, I vaguely recall hearing some of the news about the Iran-Iraq conflict and vaguely recall the Iran-Contra scandal, though never really understood what the issues were. I recall watching the Berlin Wall collapse and being told that America had won the Cold War but never really understood what the Cold War was. Then, in 1991, George H.W. Bush sent troops into Kuwait to defend the tiny Gulf nation from the Iraqi military. Several years later, Bill Clinton sent the military under NATO command to fight in what was essentially a civil war in Yugoslavia and the U.S. military, for reasons still unknown, bombed an aspirin factory. As a teenager, I was taught to respect those who had served in the military and was told, without them, we'd be speaking German right now. And people died for your freedom. Because I didn't know any better, I believed the things I was told. As a senior in high school, because of my high score on the ASVAB, I was recruited heavily by the U.S. Navy to become a nuclear engineer on a submarine. I was also recruited by the Marines and preferred the possibility of working at a U.S. Embassy to living in a tiny metal tube. I signed preliminary paperwork with the U.S. Marines in March 1996. However, after much prayer for God's guidance in my decision, I became a conscientious objector. I was also taught about Switzerland and that one reason they weren't involved in either world war was because of their official position of remaining neutral and being an isolationist country. I remember saying several times to my friends, there's a lot to be said for being an isolationist country. Look at Switzerland. Then on that Tuesday in September 2001, everything changed. For the first time since 1941, America was attacked by an outside entity. My initial response after the shock wore off was that the military should carpet bomb the entire Middle East back into the Stone Age. After all, they attacked us first. A few months later, I began to think, logically and rationally, if 19 people hijacked airplanes and flew them into buildings, then the guilty people are dead. There is no need to kill more innocent people. While I did not support the invasion of Iraq in 2003, I was not necessarily opposed to it either, partly because I didn't want to be seen as supporting the terrorist. We knew that Saddam Hussein was a bad guy, right? Why was there the need to falsely claim that he possessed weapons of mass destruction? After George W. Bush's mission accomplished moment and the U.S. military remained in Iraq, I was convinced that invading was the wrong thing to do. If you order a pizza, the delivery guy leaves after delivering the pizza. He doesn't stay to help you eat it. Furthermore, there was no declaration of war to invade Iraq or Afghanistan for that matter, which makes the war even more illegal. More on that later. What I would later find out is that that American foreign policy, especially the interventionist foreign policy in the Middle East, began long before September 2001 or even the Iran-Iraq conflict of the 1980s. The U.S. government either covertly or overtly supported at least three successful coups in the Middle East between 1949 and 1963, as well as several that were unsuccessful, not to mention the support to undermine or weaken the governments of several Middle Eastern countries, or the support of Afghani freedom fighters to expel the Soviet invasion, or the sanctions imposed against the governments of Iran and Iraq, or the aid to the Israeli military in the form of money and weapons, which in part has been used to oppress the Palestinians. In in short, for 50-plus years before September 11, 2001, the government of the United States was intervening in the Middle East, and for the 10 years before, the U.S. military was bombing Iraq and building bases. In 2007, Ron Paul said, What would we say here if China was doing this in our country or in the Gulf of Mexico? We would be objecting. We need to look at what we do from the perspective of what would happen if somebody else did it to us. Some people say that anyone who says blowback is the reason for 9-11 is blaming America for 9-11, which is absurd. Explaining why someone responded in a certain manner is not the same as condoning the response. Between late 2004 and early 2007, I was still in a transition phase. The mission accomplished moment had persuaded me that the Iraq invasion was wrong. The Afghan government saw its first direct election. Democracy was one of the goals of the war on terror, right? 
And I finally began looking at the actual cost of the fighting, not just the monetary cost, which in 2006 was over $400 billion, but also the human cost, approximately 60,000 civilians in Iraq and upwards of 28,000 Afghan civilians, not including the thousands of military personnel who were killed as a result of the fighting. By late 2007, the I Support the Troops magnet was off my vehicle. By late 2008, there was a War is Not the Answer sticker in its place. My anti-war position was only strengthened after Private Manning revealed information exposing possible war crimes in 2010. During a pre-trial conference on February 28, 2013, Manning, reading from a prepared statement, said there was no pressure by WikiLeaks to release the information that the Washington Post, the New York Times, and Reuters had been approached with the documents, but they did not want what was being offered. Manning admitted to being upset or disturbed by the leaked information, but that it did not not contain anything that would harm the United States if it became public. Regarding the so-called collateral murder video, Manning said the most alarming part to me was the seemingly delightful bloodlust and that those in the video seem to not value human life by referring to them as dead bastards. Manning added, I was disturbed by the response to injured children. I wanted the American people to know that not everyone in Iraq and Afghanistan was a target that needed to be engaged and neutralized and concluded, I believe that if the general public had access to the information. This could spark a domestic debate as to the role of the military and foreign policy in general, and I felt I accomplished something that would allow me to have a clear conscience. For this act of courage, and being a whistleblower is an act of courage, Private Manning was sentenced to 35 years in prison, and unfortunately, the domestic debate that Private Manning hoped to spark seems to have never really begun. I have come full circle back to a non-interventionist position. There is a misconception among many people that those who support a foreign policy of non-intervention are the same as those supporting isolationism. Not only is this assumption incorrect, it is based on ignorance and years of misinformation. While isolationists are by definition non-interventionist, they're also ardent nationalist or protectionist. Isolationism is properly defined as a foreign policy which combines abstention from alliances and other international intervention, non-interventionism, and economic relations, protectionism. It asserts both of the following non-interventionism, the refusal to become involved in another country's business problems, etc., and protectionism, a policy of government economic protection for domestic producers through restrictions on foreign competitors. The key difference between isolationism and non-interventionism, or interventionist for that matter, is that most everyone practices non-interventionism in his or her private life. How can I be sure that most people practice non-intervention in their private life? It's actually quite easy. The principle of non-intervention is related to the non-aggression axiom, which states that it shall be legal for anyone to do anything he wants, provided only that he not initiate or threaten violence against the person or legitimately owned property of another. Most everyone gets through the day without interfering in the life of other people. Sure, you interact with people. This is the individual equivalent of international free trade. However, you rarely, if ever, involve yourself in the disputes of other people, unless the dispute involves involves a friend, loved one, or someone that asks for your assistance, this is the individual equivalent to the philosophy proposed by Thomas Jefferson. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. In Incline to Liberty, Louis Carabini explains the small group, large group fallacy. In a small setting, it is easy to envision all the effects of an action, thereby giving a proposal a more accurate evaluation. Reasoning and common sense, intuition, can be valuable tools when predicting the outcome of a proposed policy or event within a small group. However, such tools become far less reliable when assessing outcomes in larger groups. When we interact with others in small groups, our instincts, for the most part, tell us without much deliberation that we can achieve our goal with less effort and conflict when the means to those goals align with the golden rule. In a family, neighborhood, company, business relationship, or similar small group, most of us will adopt the golden rule as our guide. However, we tend to abandon that concept when it comes to a large political group. If non-intervention is not only practiced but welcomed by individuals and small groups of people, why should it not be practiced by the nation as a whole?